Hey there, my friends. Well, I'd like you to join me on a little bit of a, a reading here from a book that I picked up a few months back. And it was actually a book to complete a set that I have, which is Pharmacopoeia and Pharmacognosis. And the third and final installment that actually went with the Pharmacopoeia was the Pharmacodynamis. This is Stimulating Plants, Potions, and Herbcraft, Excitiantia and Pathogenica by Dale Pendle. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is a sequel from a 1996 book that he wrote. And the original set was given to me by a friend, and he knows it was a, a solstice gift from my friend Tim. And he knows that I am a, let's just say that part of my path is the poison path, the plant path. And as I went back and forth, and I've discussed this with a lot of people, some people are very immersed in drug culture, and they consume a lot of substances. Some people are very opposed to taking substances, drugs, to alter the mind. And then there are the plant users, or those of us who use them to attain a certain state of awareness in order to look at all facets of life. In other words, I will be a plant and substance user for as long as it brings me awareness in any way, shape, or form. But most of all, as I spoke the other day about novelty, it's more than just addiction. It's more than a compulsion to try substances. Because the seeker of plant and, uh, you know, drug awarenesses or knowledge, those who seek through substance use, uh, there are many different types of people. And many aren't just trying to escape those who take psychedelics know that it's a burden, often. For me, to take psychedelics to explore my mind is a burden. It's something I put off and don't want to deal with. It's almost like a bad job that I don't want to get finished because it's too much work, but it's something I know I have to do because I grow from it. So from the eyes of someone who doesn't do psychedelics, they may think, oh, this person maybe likes to take acid and trip out and look at colors. When the hallucinations are merely a byproduct of the awareness that comes. But psychedelics are in a class by themselves. When we come to stimulants um, and, and plants that, uh, let's just talk about coffee, cocaine, amphetamines, these are all very conducive to the Western capitalist way of life. No longer can we sit calmly, meditate, and relax. We have fast-paced lives, and therefore we seek to fill that. So. Without going too far and getting too into detail, I uh, just read this little part of the beginning. Now, as just to let you know, this is done in a poetic fashion. So I may pause at the end and then read one line where it would be uh, in italics, you know, and it, it's very hard to uh, get across what's being conveyed here, but I'll do my best. On the nature of poison. Pharmacodynamics is the study of the effects and actions of drugs on living organisms. The Greek word denotes the power and force. Theophrastus used it to refer specifically to the intrinsic properties of plants, and Galen used dynamis uh, in a book title. And, in a sense of power, dynamis could also mean medicine, the particular powers or manifestations of divine beings, and, as suits us here, a collection of formulae or prescriptions or incantations. <laughs> Poetry, in the tradition of Baudelaire and Rimbaud, is an example of poison path praxis, that through self-experiment and self-examination one can know the taste of water, as they say, for oneself. Doesn't look like water to me. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus uses the word dynamis to refer to his miracles, warning the cities in which he performed them that they would be judged most harshly for not being more impressed. Jesus is also the pharmacon, the medicine, and obliquely, obliquely the pharmacos, the scapegoat, and the one who heals the village by being sacrificed. The history of power plants and the fate of their users illustrates over and again the persistence of this etymological linkage in the, in the real politic of modern nation-states. To become wise, 
one must wish to have certain experiences, and run, as it were, into their gaping jaws. This, of course, is very dangerous. Many a wise guy has been swallowed. Nietzsche. <laughs> the pharmacon is both a remedy and a poison, a baneful drug or a, medi or a medicinal restorative. Homer uses the word both ways. It also means charm or spell, deriving from uh, filter or enchanted potion, and English potion, again, is poison through medieval French, the first poison being love potions. Po poison potion drug is rooted in love. Proto-Indo-European, a Sanskrit cousin, van, desire, in German, also Dutch, Danish, Swedish. Poison is gift, thought to have come to that meaning euphemistically through marriage, as in Old English gift, the bride price, that which must be paid. And perhaps, by analogy, to the Greek, to the Greek, uh, well, they write in Greek, I can't read it, the Greek something, which is gift, payment, or dose of medicine. We begin with the substance, but we must not end there. We seek the primal poison, the root illness, the prima materia. Mother of all suffering, Pandora, the bearer of gifts, and the all-gifted, who completed the world as we know it. We may call her Maya, or the all-suffering mother, Mary, or Kuan Yin. Opening the jar is the hermetic pursuit. Hermes inspired Pandora, as the serpent inspired Eve, that mortals might have the gift of knowledge, the poison of the gods. The double-edged sword of intellect, reason as our most spectacular poison, concepts as frozen mind, Huxley's ice cubes, the mind road that builds on itself, arches and walls and verbs and nouns. General and abstract ideas are the source of the greatest errors of mankind. But we also forge hammers and drills, wrecking bars. We can poison like with like, but this method is intrinsically and topologically limited. It is like someone who lives on the surface of a cylinder, trying to draw an arrow to the center. We are limited to inference and analogy. At some point, we must brave a bad trip through the Afanor, the alchemical furnace. Maya is Mara, the tempter, the temptress. In the heat of transmutation, Mara panics, clinging to the wisps of flame, already broken up and half consumed. Mara releases a phantasmagoria of dreams and visions, secrets and powers. Fission triggers fusion, Scattering patterns emerge, imply hidden and deeper structures. <laughs> Leptin, trails in bubble, chambers, centaurs in clouds. <laughs> Cryptographia on beach sand, the deciphering is more art than science. The secret meaning of the morning star. If you seek it in forms or colors, if you seek it in voices you hear, you are on a false path and won't find. Thus come. That is from Diamond Sutra. Buddhists are wary of visions, see them as sirens, as will-o'-the-wisps that recede further and further into the swamps when pursued. Ma, the hemp spirit, Mara, the devil in the phenomenal world. Mayeko are visions that appear at certain stages of the meditation path. The Surangama Sutra lists 50 types of Mikayo, 10 for each of the five aggregates. No, I'm just going to skip that part, sorry. <laughs> the poison doctor should appreciate this offering of lunar wisdom without succumbing to belief in its converse, a grand and most enduring hallucination. The word is makyo, but not nihilistic. Just because nothing exists does not mean nothing is real. Just because they have no reality doesn't mean that they aren't there. Who are we, anyway? Angels cursed and cast down? Rintra roaring emanations out of emanations, circles and reflections of the divine, and connected thereto by any means of various complicated paths, or possibly directly, or possibly not. Mu, there is always that possibility. The way of the poisoner is the path of Makyo. No way around that. Let the Antichrist speak. For your consideration, double pain is easier to bear than single pain, do you accept my dare? Nietzsche. <laughs> 
And I could uh, go on, this book goes on to talk about all the various stimulants, um, everything from ecstasy to coffee and speed and the cat plant and uh, piperazine. <clears throat> and uh, when getting into these, you find a certain, um, you either find an attraction and an understanding, or you don't. And I guess the reason why this comes up right now is because it's something I've been pondering a lot whether or not a life without substances or without altered states is the more desirable life than the life with altered states. And in absolutely no way can I make the assumption that that is a yes or a no question. In absolutely no way can I prescribe a particular life for everyone. And whereas the man who chooses not to take the poison path may find he dives in headfirst straight into life, and is completely content, that's fine. The next man may find that he enjoys <laughs> immersing himself in other ways of thinking, in altered states of thinking. And the biggest, I think, confusion comes is when people think that a person is getting high just for the sake of getting high. Those who take certain substances are well aware of having a puke bowl handy or preparing for the, the bad part of it. And, you know, things like ayahuasca or ibogaine, people don't take it to have fun. People take it to grow. And psychedelics are well known as these growth tools, yet some other substances are lesser known and maybe a little milder. And when it comes to stimulants, I think that we tend to dismiss them. Uh, we've put down all the hardcore things like cocaine and methamphetamines for obvious reasons, because they're abused by people who aren't using them as tools but are using them as uh, ways to escape, rather. And, and methamphetamine is a well-known drug that was used successfully in small doses for soldiers for a long time, and many people still use it in small doses. But if you were to tell someone, hey, I like to do a little bit of methamphetamine, just a little bit, once in a while, instantly there's a picture painted of, well, this person's a speed freak. And the same thing with cocaine, which was well accepted in the 80s during the me generation. But as of today, we just laugh at something like cocaine. It's a fool's drug. These white drugs mostly have no place. Uh, these particular powders, these short acting. But it doesn't mean that cocaine itself, or the coca plant itself rather, is useless. Um, in Peru, when they would chew what they call a quid, a quid is a big group of leaves that you put in and chew, and they would chew the coca leaves for energy. And they would determine, they would actually measure the length of distances on these long journeys by how many quids it took to get there. And so, cocaine was a form of measurement, if you will. I shouldn't say cocaine, I should say coca, because cocaine is the extracted process, and this is where it all becomes a problem. When extracts are made, when drugs are concentrated in heavy forms, when you're taking speed instead of ephedra, you know, when you're doing coke instead of chewing coca, um, we get ourselves into trouble because we overexcite our bodies. The very thing that is used for medicine can also be used as a poison and vice versa. Now homeopathy has used this bullshit as, I should say, used this truth as a way to perpetuate bullshit. Um, I, I, I'm not much of a, I don't believe in homeop homeopathic medicine. I believe that it's all completely placebo effect. Um, they, it's based on the water memory effect. Um, basically, if you want to talk about homeopathic medicine, it's like one drop of real medicine uh, put in the entire ocean of the world. And that's the, the diluted rate. We're talking diluted hundreds, thousands of times. And the idea is that the water retains this memory, this intention. Um, so what I'm getting at here is that many herbs, many medicines, many drugs also have this psychological placebo effect where a person may or may not know that something is working or helping them, whereas the substance they're taking may not be doing anything, but the person's mind is growing or learning or believing something works. And uh, I think that this can be extended into uh, understanding how some of these plants work a little bit better by uh, figuring out which ones aren't placebo and which ones actually make an effect. Altering the chemistry of our brains is not something we should take lightly. It's something we should be very serious about. 
but also realize that the line between taking an SSRI and eating, you know, turkey for dinner is really not that much different. You know, you're consuming tryptophan, which can be used as building blocks for serotonin or whatnot. Um, this is why you get tired after you eat turkey. There's so much more to it, though. There's so much more to the way the brain works. And like I was talking with somebody the other day, he pointed out that uh, dopamine isn't really an issue as far as low dopamine levels. Uh, very few cases of it, which was a great thing to learn. Uh, what I've learned about medicines is that we don't really understand how most of them work. And people trust their doctors, and they'll prescribe them Prozac or Valium, and they'll be happy to take it. But when it comes to something that's a natural herb that's looked upon or frowned upon, like let's say Kratom, for example, somebody heard about it on the news, oh, didn't it kill that kid? And then plants become bad. And then we frown and look down on people who consume substances, even though they may be doing it for the right reasons, because they are on a poison path. So other people don't have to be. Because not everybody's going to try every substance. If you want to find something that's going to work for your heartburn, you're going to look up to see what other people have discovered for you. You're letting other people do the work for you. That's what humans do. But at a certain point, we have to learn to respect the experimenters. For example, a person may be happy to take all the drugs that are available on the market when they need them. But if a person, they see a person trying a new drug or new substance, they'll say, oh, you're an idiot. You know, why would you try that? And they'd say, well, somebody has to do it. And say, oh, we can test it on rats or mice. But the thing is, it takes years for many of these things to come through in research, whereas people are doing it on their own independently. So I'm just saying we should give a little bit of credit to those pharmaco people, if you will. And uh, I myself, I guess, reluctantly say that I, I am a, uh, you know, I, I am a, very interested and very uh, fascinated by plant medicine and I probably will continue to be for the rest of my life. It's just uh, just so long as I'm not debilitating myself or um, consuming it for the wrong reasons. Ultimately it's to gain clarity and understanding and to be happy because god damn it we all deserve to be happy. <laughs> as long as we're not happy for the wrong reasons. So,